Gentlemen, it's now over to you, the audience. We are going to have a question and answer session now. There are two microphones in the aisles. Um, we invite you to queue up. Um, people can also send in questions via paper. And uh, we will take the microphones alternately. So we are now going to have a question and answer session where you can address uh, any of the participants of the debate tonight, or we need both of them. So uh, please, uh, please queue up and we will take the first question from my right shortly. Right, we'll uh, commence with the question and answer session now. Yes, the gentleman on my right over there. Thank you. Uh, this is the point of the British and sisters. I've just got um, some questions to clarify. Hopefully I can get a calm and logical answer um, for all our educated audience to um, hear. I'd just like to clarify, um, I would like you guys, if possible, to really clarify, assume as I've done in this, yeah? Um, please provide succinct um, answers and logical ones about the existence of um, the universe, this physical universe. I think Dr. Uh, Brother Hamza has uh, mentioned it quite clear from his perspective on um, the finite physical um, 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 starting point of uh, our um, universe. Um, but and I'm sure you guys have agreed earlier that um, the um, um, the, the universe started from nothing, and um, Dr. Hamza was, um, sorry, Brother Hamza was um, pointing out how could nothing um, produce nothing, and there must be an uh, extra physical, um, which uh, the potentiality of nothing to that. Um, but, but just please, um, Dr. Ed, if you could uh, uh, explain um, in logical manner how this nothing could create something immensely what we've seen today. Thank you. I, I heard very little of your question. I heard a little, and I think I can answer at least the last part based on what I heard. But either you should stand by or maybe you can help me with this question. The, the, the last part which I did hear is how could nothing have come from nothing, uh, and how do I explain that? Uh, I, I accept the cosmologist explanation that we had the Big Bang, that there was nothing before that, and that we actually know nothing. I mean nothing about what was before that, because there was no time or space before that. We have no knowledge about it at all. We can, and many theists do, uh, decide that we will call that nothing God. We can do as uh, uh, Hamza uh, Tortoise did and, and use uh, the first cause argument and say there must have been a cause and therefore we'll call it God. But that is illogical to make that, that is no more an argument for God than my saying the universe must have existed until the Big Bang and before that there was nothing and there is no cause. If you accept his argument that there has to have been a God, then the same things that led him to say that would lead you to say, okay, what caused God? What, when, did, when did God start existing? If it's not eternal? If we cannot have an infinite regress, we can't have causes causing causes, you have to stop somewhere. That is no reason to say, therefore, we have to stop with a step beyond our understanding and call that God or Allah. It, it, what you say is, look, before the beginning or before the start of the universe, uh, we don't know. But saying we don't know, is not the, that's not evidence for God. That just means we don't know. And if the first cause argument breaks down if you apply it to God, so apply it instead to the universe. The universe is the first cause of everything we see here today. And the physical constants and pressures and, and processes uh, that led to what, has, what we are. I don't know if I answered the first part because I really didn't hear most of it. So just, that, so, so just one short answer, I think yes or no. Do you think nothing can lead to something? I think yes or no? Just I, I think in the, uh, obviously we had at the beginning of the universe something coming from nothing, uh, or from nothing that we know anything about. Yes. Okay, I mean, I, I think we could yeah, respond yeah, to each question. It's just probably like, I mean, don't take a question again, but listening, I haven't given you a first course argument. I'm giving you an argument the following way. 
Whatever begins to exist as a cause, that premise you cannot deny. If a pink elephant popped right next to me, and I said this came out of nothing, then well, it came out of so nothing. So what caused God? Well, listen to, I'm going to answer that question. What's very interesting as well is this, is that if we follow your philosophy of that things can come out of nothing, then there is no point even having a conversation. Do you know why? Because I can claim anything. You know what? Oh my God. My mother is not my mother. She's actually a grey rhino that was born on Pluto and she flew here in a giant feather. That doesn't surprise me. <laughs> <laughs> so, it's very humorous, but it's not much of an argument. Dr. Buckman, I'd like to remind you that uh, Hunter does boxing and martial arts. <laughs> <laughs> so, the point I'm trying to make is. But that's his mother. <laughs> Okay, let me just finish the question. I think two mama cusses is too much for you. I think we have to put a stop to that. Either. So the point I'm trying to make is this, is that if we go down your route, then we can't have science, we can't have philosophy, we can't have logic, no point opening a bank, no point living, no point discussing, no point searching for truth. So we can't go down that route because it's contradictory and it goes against things that we already know to be true. Now you said what That's caused... That's obviously not true. Now you said what caused God. But the question here is not even about causalities, whatever begins to exist has a cause. We're saying God never began to exist by concept and by principle. And if we just say then what caused God, well let's ask the question, then what caused the cause that caused God? Then if we do that ad infinitum, then there's no God and there's no creation. So by rational necessity, it's telling us there's a cause. And I'm not saying now, and again, listening is very important. I'm not saying now, there's a cause for the universe, therefore it must be God. I even mentioned that. How do we know it's Allah? How do we know it's Jesus? How do we know who this thing is? I said upon something called conceptual analysis, we come to the conclusion it must be one, eternal, unique, immaterial, and personal. And this is why it's unfair to say, oh, it's the prime mover, prime, prime mover argument, it's the first cause argument. I've given you the reasons why that's not the case. No, so let's, strange, let's be attentive. Well, it's oh. not. How is it the same argument? Explain to me. Okay, I think we've okay. allowed each uh, speaker to have a crack at that question. Can we take a question from that side, please? Yes, sir. Uh, Assalamu alaikum. Uh, I just want to point to something that hasn't been addressed yet by Brother Hamza. Um, Dr. Ed Buckman mentioned that uh, because Allah has many names and many attributes, that therefore it's contradictory. Yeah. So if I were to say that you, Sir Ed Buckner, is someone who is calm but then can be angered, somebody who is who is um, generous, but then somebody who can be spiteful. All these attributes can be part of your character, but that doesn't mean that, therefore, does not mean that you are not Ed Buckner. It is not contradictory to yourself. It is, it is not contradictory, of course, to say that a, a character, whether Ed Buckner or God, not quite the equivalent, but uh, any, any individual or character can have complex characteristics be one thing at one time and one thing another. And that was not the point that I was saying is contradictory. I remember this was in regard to the problem of evil, the problem of suffering. This is, it, it, uh, Hamza has said in his writing uh, that uh, this is not a problem because God has many faces because there are many different names for Allah. But I don't think that Islam accept as one of the names for Allah uh, capricious and pointless killer of children. And yet, in the uh, tsunami of 250,000 dead, thousands and thousands of children were killed pointlessly. That is not consistent with a God, a good God, a bad God, or a God who's living man. That was my point. This also shows the difference between the atheist worldview and the Islamic worldview. Let's, let me give you a scenario. The atheist worldview is as follows. You have a crap life in a crap existence, being very poor, a tsunami comes, you drown, and you die. Atheist worldview, that's it. Islamic worldview, you have a bad existence, you have no money, a tsunami comes, you drown, you die, and oh, here's eternal bliss. Well, I'm not saying which one. You, you can characterize the Islamic point of view, but you did not correctly characterize the atheist point well, of view. Well, in fairness, you, you, you characterize our own mother, so I could do what I like now. And, <laughs> No, you didn't characterize the views. So I don't like when people don't characterize my views yeah. and then claim they have. Okay, my view of the atheistic worldview, and the point is, well, I think you misread my article, which is quite interesting. You actually read my article, um, but you should read the Quran first next time. Yeah? <laughs> and the point I'm trying to make is this: is that we believe 
God has, never, has many names and attributes. And one of the names and attributes is that he's the wise. Now, he's what? He's the wise. The wise. There's wisdom in things. Now, you may say, well, I can't see the wisdom. Ha! Huh. But that's a logical fallacy. It's called an argument from ignorance. Just because you can't see something, it doesn't mean necessarily it actually solves a problem. So philosophically, logically, we solve the logical problem of evil, and it's not a problem. We say, God is all wise. If you can't see the wisdom, just be, it doesn't mean it's not there. I suggest everyone, Muslims and non-Muslims, to read a very interesting chapter of the Qur'an, which is chapter 18 of the Qur'an, that has an amazing narrative between Moses, peace and blessings be upon him, and this personality called Khidr. And they have this amazing narrative going on about the wisdom of God. And if you read it, I think it solves the problem of evil from the point of view that God is also all wise. But there's other, many, many other reasons why we believe the problem of evil is not actually a problem. Uh, because we believe people who drown, they have eternal bliss. We believe people who are buried under rubble, they have eternal bliss. Anyone who has uh, illnesses from the stomach have eternal bliss. To the point when they're in this bliss, they'll look back and say, I would do it again to be in this state. Do you see? Um, but from the logical I see that you believe that. I understand that Islam yeah, uh, of course. believe and that, yeah. but that's not evidence for its truth. And, I, well, I think and the point I was making is that you have a reality which is inconsistent with the designer God. You have a reality that you would get if, in fact, these things evolve. Biological evolution, the uh, evolution of, of the universe, the breaking up of planets, spinning off, and so forth. You have physical forces that do terribly destructive things that obviously don't care about human beings. I, I'm not trying to say that, that uh, your God is evil and goes around killing little kids. I'm trying to say that the natural forces are, goes around, go around killing little kids. Oh, it's a and, and that that's inconsistent with the existence of any God. No, it's not. It's, it's inconsistent. It is whether you say it is or not. Well, well, that's fine. You can speak by yourself. But the thing is, let me give you my perspective. It's inconsistent if you believe God is just good. Muslims don't believe God is just good. If it's just good, like many, I know Christian theology has developed a lot now, but many in the past, they thought God is just love. I don't see much love, therefore, oh my God, what's the problem? We're saying we have a little bit more of a comprehensive view on who God is. He's the just, he's the kind, he's the wise, he's the one who punishes, etc., etc. And these are reconcilable concepts that deal with reality. He's, you're, a, you're he's the one who kills several hundred thousand people and we can't understand anything about why. But no. So well, that makes him... See, there's a difference. Somebody if you don't can... understand why, it doesn't negate existence. Again, that's a logical fallacy. <laughs> Arguing from ignorance. It, it, it just it because... the basis for believing that it makes sense to believe in a God when no. you have such an irrational... Uh, Doctor, you are conflating from an existence of something, again, ontology to finding out things about something. So you always complain between ontology and epistemology. I'm, I'm saying you're trying to find out something about like God. Like a boat on a very dodgy ocean. God makes no sense. Okay, I think, I think, I think, I think that's why. Let's, 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 let's move forward. Let's move, yeah, let's move forward. 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 Let's move I repeat, what if you are wrong? Okay? And uh, specifically to Brother Dr. Ibn, I have a Quran for you as a symbol of friendship. Thank you. 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 Thank Right, so first of all, that question which is regarding what if you're wrong, let, we'll let Hamza do it first on that one. What if you're wrong? This is equivalent of the argument of Pascal's wager. He's saying you should be someone who believes in a religion because, you know, the consequences of believing that are tremendous. Um, I think the question is wrong as well because the question assumes relativism and skepticism and something that I don't really think is a valid worldview that you may be right, you may be wrong, uh, it's all relative, there is no real truth. Uh, so I don't agree with the, the philosophy behind that question, but just to entertain it, if I'm wrong, then it's fine. If he's wrong, he's in trouble. <laughs> <laughs> it's very interesting that you don't think Pascal's wager is worth considering and then you just repeat it. Well, just, you, very, just for the human let me comment on it. There are, a number, there are a number of reasons why there are problems with Pascal's 
later, and you should be not. You should stop when you had finished projecting it and not repeat it. Uh, of getting the, the one the from the audience. Uh, uh, in fact, what if you are wrong implies there are only two possibilities, and there are thousands. There are thousands of religions in the world, and many of those religions will insist that you believe their particular view, or else you go to hell. Now. Pascal's wager makes no sense on that ground. It also makes no sense on the ground that you can't force yourself to accept something that doesn't make any sense to you, that you think that is not well supported, even if you think there are consequences. If I'm not mistaken, I don't know about Islam. I know in, term, in Christian terms, their beliefs are that God can read your mind and knows what you're thinking. So pretending you believe when you really don't doesn't help you. You've got to actually believe. I suspect the same thing is true for Islam. Uh, so I can't actually believe unless I've got some good reasons to it. I haven't seen any. And the fact that I haven't read this book should not give you much hope because I've read lots of holy books and they haven't been successful in uh, persuading me. So Pascal's wager fa fails on so many different subjects. One, my favorite is, and this is a poss as much a possibility as the others, Imagine that there is a god, we can call her a female, just to make it interesting. There's a female god who wants in her heaven with her only people who are intelligent enough to reject the inadequate evidence that she has provided. So only atheists go to heaven, and all of the believers go elsewhere. Now, I don't believe that. I'm not saying I do. It's not a supportable uh, belief. But it's just as well supported as any other variation of Pascal's wager. So if, if and, and a more serious answer to the Pascal's wager question is, if, I, if he is wrong, then he has wasted a great deal of his obvious talent as a speaker and his considerable uh, energy and, and time and education pursuing a little of the wisp that will carry him nowhere. Uh, Islam has some value. I, I told you at the very beginning of my first talk that is, Islam has uh, a reputation for being hospitable and friendly and gracious. Uh, so if, in fact, that religion or that combination of culture and religion succeeds in making you hospitable people and being good to each other, that's a great thing, and I'm in favor of it. But there is no two choices that you have to make the right one or you go to hell, and I don't think a serious Muslim would believe that either. Yeah, you're right. Okay, let's take the... Let's take another question on this side. Yes, yes, sister. Hello, Salaam Alaikum. Um, I just wanted to know, um, because you haven't really offered us like an alternative point of view, um, I really want to know um, what your ideology is, what you think the person, purpose of existence is, and what the point of your life is. Well, I don't think there is any point to our existence, if by that you mean external to human beings, if you mean ultimate, if you mean where we are finally going in the long run. I don't think there is any such, there is no answer to that. I believe that uh, life is arbitrary and capricious and meaningless from a point of view outside of human society. But I think that what matters is our view inside, the subjective view, and I think it's very important that we treat each other well, that we live a good, rich life. I, I said much earlier that I disagreed with Hamza's characterization of what I think uh, the atheist view of life is. Uh, and I think the atheist view of life is you only get one, you better do it right. And the way you do it right is to pay attention to your fellow man, be respectful of your fellow man, be interested in your fellow man and fellow woman's ideas, principles, that you be gracious, that you be hospitable, well, I am very much a, uh, a secular humanist as well as an atheist. Why? But why? Why? Because that gives me a richer, fuller life and those that I have come to love and care about a richer, fuller life. And human life is worthwhile and, and valuable and worth protecting and interesting from the subjective point of view of human beings. You do have to start with a principle or two and you have to accept those principles, but you can't ex expect them to be absolute grounding, that, that won't work. You start with the principle that you should do no unnecessary harm. Uh, as, as the Christians put it, uh, do unto others as you would have them do unto you. 
and there are variations of that in every human, almost every human culture we know anything about. Uh, in, uh, Confucian China, and I, I'm sure there is in Islam as well. I'm just going to be very quick on, on just my 10 cents on that. And when you mentioned about you know Islam mixed with culture may, may have some good things, um, etc. I think that's quite unfair. I mean, atheists can be good people, so can humanists. But I would argue, since there's no moral driving force, no moral motivation, you're less likely to be. And that's actually not just an outdated cliche coming from the religious masses, because before the Christians and the Muslims would be like, you're an atheist, you're a bad person. But that's not really true, and I agree with that, because Dr. Ed Buckner, besides the fact that he abuses my, cusses my mother, uh, is still a really nice guy. Um, for example, in 2000, political scientist and Professor Robert Putnam, he surveyed 200 volunteer organizations, and it showed that there was a positive correlation between religiosity and membership to these philanthropic organizations. This is why the Index of Global Philanthropy says religious people are more charitable than non-religious, not only given to their own congregations, but also regardless of income, region, social class, and other demographic variables. And I think the reason for this is not an accident, because there's a positive correlation, is because there's a moral driving force, something that the sister was talking about, and purpose. And to add to the purpose, I mean, we attribute purpose to the most ridiculous things, like moths and insects. For example, there's a particular moth that its job is to eat the excrement of a moth above it when it's drinking the sap of a particular tree. Now, if there was moth genocide and we killed six million moths, we wouldn't really care. But we attribute purpose, which is almost like the toilet of the first moth. But we want to attribute something purpose to ourselves that's more dynamic and has something uh, more creative. And you know, from the atheist position, we could infer, and I think we can, that we're just on the sinking ship. We're on the Titanic, aren't we? Because the universe is going to die out one day. It's going to suffer heat death. Nothing's going to happen. So we're on the Titanic. What's the point of reshuffling the deck chair or shaking the hand of an old woman or giving her a glass of milk or whatever she drinks. But the point is, you is there... No, but let, let me make the point. You could argue when I've made the point. So... It's clearly a fallacy in that you are... I have to make the point. Only if there's an ultimate purpose can we care about each other. No, I'm not saying that. I'm not saying that. But when you, when you reduce it to relative... You only have one life, you have to do it, right? Yes, but when you have relative purpose, the issue is when someone could decide to have a purpose to basically, I have one life, I want it to be full and rich, well, let me steal. Let me eat as much as I can. Let me be like certain hegemonic empires, take all the resources, give none to no one else. And we have something called, which I call, atheist capitalism in a way, which has this world view that a very minority would have all the resources, and most of the world, like two billion people on the planet, don't even have sanitation and food and water. I mean, this is a disgrace. And I would argue because there is no moral motivation. I agree with you with your stance on relative purpose, but if you don't have more motivation, you're going to have the state of affairs that we have today. Okay, there's quite a few people on this side, so I'll take a question from this side again. Yes, well uh, Thank you to both speakers. I really enjoyed the debate. I really enjoyed listening to both perspectives, and I found it very informative, very educated, uh, and it's something new for me, so I'm very grateful for that to both of you. Um, my question has sort of been covered earlier, but I really appreciate a much more clear uh, response from um, Mr. Ed Buckner. With regards to the afterlife, as Muslims we believe that after we die, our soul will live on and we will be held accountable for our actions, our intentions, what we did, what we saw, what we thought, and so on and so forth. What is the atheist alternative to this? Can I, <clears throat> can I as someone who you believe should consider atheism, truly believe that my end as a normal, boring, average student who lives in London, having not murdered anyone, not raped anyone, not robbed anyone, will be exactly the same, you know, soil and worm food, as Hitler, who killed six million Jews, and because of those 65 million people died in the world wars, as Pete Suckling, Suckling who uh, raped and killed 17 women. Is my end really the same as this, as George Bush, who's responsible for the, the murder of hundreds and thousands in Iraq and Afghanistan? Is my end, my normal, boring existence end, the same as all these? I think your ultimate existence is the same as all of those, uh, and I think that wishing that it were different will not change the facts at all. Now, I do think there is a difference. Surely you have 
a better ability to sleep at night than George Bush. Sorry to interrupt you. What I'm asking for is an alternative. What is the atheist alternative? You criticize what I'm saying and my opinion and, and my religious well, beliefs. I, I do what understand. What is the atheist alternative? What, what I, do you believe? If I can after you die. Yeah. If I could give you an alternative uh, that that led to something better than this life, sure, I would do that. I mean, I'm not opposed to a future life of rewards and punishments. And Thomas Jefferson, one of our greatest leaders, believed in such a thing, even though he was certainly not a Christian. Uh, so I, I'm not saying that it wouldn't be wonderful somehow to imagine that justice ultimately will be done. I'm not saying that there's not uh, a, a very tantalizing uh, uh, possibility about a future life. I think that's what has kept the irrational idea of a future life alive for generations and generations of human beings, Muslims, Christians, and others, that there is some future life. But that's not evidence that there is any such future life. The fact that you want it, I want to win the lottery and I haven't done it yet. Desire does not produce what you want. So I, I would urge you to live a realistic life to understand that when you die, you're gone, and there is no more. You'll have the same kind of feeling and existence and pain and everything else after you die as you had before you were born. None at all. There's nothing to worry about. You're not going to hell. There isn't anything in the future. I can't prove that. I'm not trying to insist that it must be true. But there is no evidence to the contrary. The fact that you believe there is or want to believe it, Brother, I actually want to. I, I, I can accept I can accept that your your opinion is pretty rounded and pretty open to it can go this way or that way. Can you suggest then as as advice to me that maybe I should live the life of a drug baron in South Colombia? who live very healthy lives, very happy lives, they rob, they cheat, they steal, and they die peacefully in their sleep. They live rich lives, they eat good food, they sleep with many women. Is this the best advice for me? Is this the sort of life I should do? If I've only got one shot, if, if you know what's going to happen after, is that the best thing for me to do? If the only thing that is keeping you from robbing and raping and so forth is Islam, I definitely want you to keep your faith. Thank you. Bye. But you should keep it knowing that that has nothing to do with whether your faith is true or not, only whether it's effective in keeping you from raping and robbing and stealing. Life matters, and how you live it matters, and I certainly recommend that you live a life that you can be proud of, that you can sleep well at night, that you're happy with, uh, and that your neighbors and your friends will respect you for. Uh, I'm not suggesting that there should be no standards. I'm saying there can be no ultimate objective standards. The standards come from humanity. We're all we've got, so we better make the best of Okay, we'll now take the question from this side. Yes, please go ahead. Hi, my name is Nicole, and um, this question was asked to me by an atheist, and I didn't actually know how to answer it, but it's more to do with Islamic principles. Uh, the question was, um, does Islam contradict itself when it states that brothers and sisters and close relatives cannot marry and reproduce together? And um, isn't this the case happened with Adam and Eve at the start of humanity? I think this question is probably most likely the best. Okay, so the, the question is, in Islam, we can't have incest, basically. But you're saying, how from Adam and Eve can they reproduce? All I know, to be honest, I haven't even this question, but what I know is, is that our rulings now apply based upon the teachings of the Qur'an and the teachings of the Prophet Muhammad sallallahu And what does the Qur'an say? The Qur'an says that we can't do incest and the Prophet sallallahu never practiced it and told us not to do it either. Now what happened Adam and Eve is a different reality and to be honest I haven't investigated it. I'm sure someone in the audience will give you a really nice answer. One answer I have heard but the reason I'm not saying it is because I don't know if it's true or not. But, so I'm going to say it but it might be based on untruth is that it was allowed then, but now it's not allowed. Something like that. But I, I don't really have the answer. Okay. Yeah, just to add, uh, I could help you. Oh, totally. Well, yeah. Chairs would have done something, right? Because we have bits of paper all the day. But anyway, basically, yes, the, the, the ruling was that they had, eight, they had pairs of twins, and the ruling was that the twins could not marry each other. So they could marry other sets of twins. So this was an anomalous situation. And therefore, the, the kind of inherent, disgusting act of incest was actually waived at that, suspended for that point in time. Okay, thank you, Chair. Very, very unbiased, huh? <laughs>
Well, the other argument against that, because that's the only information I knew as well, but the other argument was, well, something was wrong at the start, but now, no, something was right at the start, so now it's wrong. Because okay. then the interim doesn't make them not brothers and yes, sisters. that's a good point. But when you talk about morality, mm -hmm. you could have... If the two situations were exactly the same, there would be a moral contradiction. But the two situations are not the same anymore. Do you see? Because one's based upon we need to have a human race in a specific historical context and time, and now we have a different kind of reality. Do you see? So the, the contradiction would be apparent if the conditions and variables are exactly the same. But they're not. Okay, well, sorry to long it out, but there was another question to that as well. And that was, um, well, wasn't the God strong enough to make two couples and their children could have reproduced? I think that's an erroneous question because then you could ask it answers say in so many ways, wasn't God strong enough to do this and that and this? This is the way he chose it and that's it. I don't think it negates Islamic theology or Christian theology or religious worldview. I mean at the end of the day the most simplest answer is this, look, it's true because God said so and that's not irrational because we can prove that God actually said it based upon the rational deduction we have shown in other arguments which Dr. Ed Buckner still has not addressed. <laughs> Okay, question now. I'm going to sorry, stop debating when I read the Quran and write it back and say it didn't work. And he'll give up his ministry, right? My um, ministry? Yeah. Okay, this is now the, the, the brother who, the forgetful brother who's involved is the one who remembered. If you don't want that to happen. My question for Dr. Yeah, Dr. Buckner. Dr. Buckner. Would you disagree with an atheist who thought that killing people is all right? And because it's for his own benefit. And if so, based on what would you disagree since you don't believe in objective morality? And then if you do, um, if you do accept it, then yes, it is okay if that's his personal beliefs. Then, yeah, that, that's what they believe. Then wouldn't, yeah, then if we were all atheists, they wouldn't, uh, we wouldn't be able to really find a common ground and wouldn't be able to. Um, you know, get together because each person would have a different belief on what's right and what's wrong. And so is it not better for the world to not accept atheism because it wouldn't cause any, you know, like I said. <laughs> the basic yeah. question about subjective morality and oh, I, I, agree with I, I did hear him. I understood. At least I think I did. If, if I miss or you tell me, I hope. Uh, I, if I knew an atheist who thought it was okay or a good idea for him to kill some people because it would be a, an advantage to him, would I argue with him and if so on what ground? That so, so, summarizes more or less what you said, yes? The answer is, of course I would argue with him. I would argue with him on a number of grounds. Uh, first and foremost, uh, criminal law. I mean, he's going to get put in jail or, or uh, executed if he engages in those things, so it's not in his best interest. Secondly, the basis for criminal law is because we human beings matter to each other. We should have standards that prevent uh, killing uh, under the circumstances you talk about. In different cultures, at different points, in different times, killing in some ways is permitted, and I think that's true for Islam as well as for others, uh, for capital punishment, uh, in self-defense, and that sort of thing. There get, there get to be very serious disagreements about these moral standards. And by the way, secular countries, countries like Sweden and Japan, have lower criminal uh, activity and lower problems with the things we usually associate with morality than the more religious countries do. Uh, uh, the US my, question, the, uh, my question is, would you accept that he thinks it's okay to no. do whatever. No. Why? Basically, Why? Why? Because we do as beings are, we are social animals. We're not in this uh, on our own. Yeah, but that's what you believe. That's what you believe personally. There's I would, no I would disagree with him. Consensus. I would disagree and with him. And if there was an atheist consensus, then wouldn't that mean that atheism is just another religion? I don't think atheism is just another religion. And I would disagree with that atheist on the, pretty much the same grounds that Hamza does, except that I wouldn't refer to the Quran or to Allah in explaining it to him. I would say it's not your best interest, it's not in the interest of society, it's against the law, it's destructive so of you're referring culture. To, so you're referring and, to yourself then? Which is all anybody does. Yes, and him referring to himself is better to 
killed whatever person. Maybe they knew the dog Steve. No, no, no. It's, it's the same for everybody, including my good friend Hamza here and all of you. No, you would our, say our, that it came from God, but in fact, it does not. Beliefs. Our morality is not based on our personal reference. It's based on what God tells us through the Quran. So you're saying that we should base our beliefs on our own reference. I'm saying you do base no, no. it on what your culture, what your uh, evolved social uh, setting has has taught you. Well, no, and and not, then you not, say, no. oh, okay, it's reinforced by what's in the Quran. That's what I believe, or the Bible, or whatever, the Book of Mormon. So but in fact, said, human beings don't behave that way. In reality, human beings develop what they want to do, then they find standards for it, and it, fortunately, there are many standards that we can develop out of self-interest. Out of, uh, it's not, uh, my friends, the objective is claim that that's an objective standard, and I disagree, but it is a basis for developing uh, moral standards, and it's one we use and have for thousands and thousands, probably hundreds of thousands of generations. Okay, we'll finish that discussion there. We'll just take one more question from this side. You are welcome to come and speak to any of the speakers after the debate tonight. Uh, and address your questions personally. So uh, thank you very much for being patient. Uh, unfortunately, we've only got a fixed amount of time. So we'll just take one question on that side and then we'll have the final three minute summary from each speaker. Okay, um, I've got two questions. The first one is, uh, one question. Um, how do you explain the fact that we are on Earth and that we exist as atheists? How, how do I explain that we, we human beings exist? Yeah, how do you Explain the fact that we're here talking now. Well, it's, uh, it'll only take me a few hours, but uh, let me give it a stab. Uh, biologically, we exist because of evolution. Uh, the processes which are now very well understood uh, evolved from a variety of other animals. I started to say lower animals, but actually there's no lower and higher in evolution. But if, if we evolve from animals, how can there still those animals around today? Well, all of the animals that are around today evolved from earlier uh, varieties of animal, and if you trace it all the way back, we have common ancestors, but it's not that we replace the monkeys or that we replace the insects. All of the animals and, and plants and bacteria and other uh, forms of life that are around today evolved from earlier forms and ultimately probably from only one form. And how that happened, no one knows yet. And I certainly don't claim that I do either. Now there's something that's far more important probably, at least to us, than mere biological evolution, and that's cultural development, which has some things in common with evolution. It does change over time, it does get selected out by uh, various pressures, but it's not at all the same thing as biological evolution. And I don't think that that uh, tells us what our moral standards should be in either case. Our moral standards have to come from how we think we should treat each other and how we should have a rich and full life. And pretending that they came from a god doesn't help in any case and often hurts in many cases. So how we got here is a long and complicated story and it is a matter of cultural development, learning from each other from generation to generation and from group of human beings to other human beings as well as biological evolution. Okay, can I say that, do you think there's a reason for everything that happens? I'm sorry? Do you think there's a reason for everything that happens? I, I don't understand about everything. Like, that. you said for everything that happens, there's a reason for it. Oh, there's a cause. I, I think within the natural world, within anything we know anything about, there is a cause so for everything. Think as, and as the ultimate people. cause is the universe itself and the processes that are developed. Uh, that are the physical processes of the universe, and that they did not have a cause. And I think that that is exactly equivalent, uh, theoretically, to saying there's a God and He didn't have a cause. You, you know, you don't really have a first cause available to anybody, whether they're religious or not. Uh, you, you have to say somewhere it started, you want to believe it was a God, you can say it was Allah, but you have no evidence for that. I say the universe. The natural universe just is, it's a brute fact. It wasn't caused, we don't know why the Big Bang happened, it probably, probably wasn't a why, an answer to that.
Okay, I think we're gonna, we're gonna the discussion is gonna carry on as I said afterwards because we've got a tight schedule. We also need to break Maghrib Salah. Uh, Dr. Butler won't be leading it. I think that's quite safe to say. Um, it's Quran, you know, he hasn't read the Quran. I suspect that the conversation will carry on for a very long time. <laughs>
We have to test for truth, and we agree on that. But when we test for truth, you can't just uh, take the circular part of, well, okay, I believe in uh, the Quran is beautiful, and therefore I'll check and see, is it beautiful? Yeah, it's beautiful. Well, you start with that conclusion, you're going to find that conclusion. Uh, religion makes human life worse overall. Some religions more than others. I don't mean that all religions are equally destructive of human life and happiness. Islam has done its share of causing uh, harm and unhappiness in the world. So certainly has Christianity and Judaism and uh, Buddhism and other religions as well. Uh, there, there is no objective morality and claiming that there is, simply asserting that there is, does not make it true. Uh, I would respectfully submit uh, that in this case, uh, Mr. Hamza Sortis did not make his case. Thank you very much, gentlemen. Uh, just like to remind uh, the audience here that there are still a couple of other debates and discussions in this series. So thank you very much for attending. We will now break for Maghrib Salah. And I now leave with the uh, Islam greeting. Assalamu alaikum wa rahmatullahi wa barakatuh.